fantastic place, also a trustee, and uh, most importantly, uh, began my first job right in that kitchen, um, <clears throat> dealing with a giant machine called Hobart, <clears throat> uh, which um, at the time was um, uh, the highest state of technology in dishwashing. <clears throat> Uh, but to, so it's always great for me to come back here at, uh, at the ATH and uh, today especially a treat as uh, my good friend Neil Kashkari has uh, rearranged his very complicated schedule <clears throat> to make it out here to visit with us uh, and his lovely wife Christine is with us and um, uh, we couldn't be happier to um, get them out of the, uh, uh, the frozen north, although uh, Minneapolis is starting to thaw a little bit, so it's uh, probably not that big of a sacrifice. So um, uh, also uh, Cameron Shelton is here. Uh, he's going to moderate with Neil, and as always here, we expect um, a full engagement from the students um, and free, uh, uh, free interchange on, uh, on, on Q&A. Uh, Cameron, as you know, is our distinguished professor of um, PPE. Uh, he also, um, close to my heart, holds the McMahon Chair of the Political Economy. Uh, so uh, very special for me um, to be able to introduce uh, Cameron as well. Uh, you have all read uh, Neil's bio, so I'm not going to read it again to you. But I am going to share uh, some reasons why he is, in my mind, um, one of my uh, favorite friends. Um, you may have noticed in that biography, as extensive as it is, uh, a giant black hole. And the black hole is that you'd think for a guy of his incredible accomplishment and distinction in leadership that he would have gone to CMC. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, it's a bit sad in a way because uh, he does have all those characteristics that we believe exemplify uh, the uh, CMC graduate. Um, uh, right along with um, his passion for making a difference uh, in the commercial arena is his passion for making a difference in the social arena. Uh, in fact, his uh, resume is replete with the tension between the two, if you'll notice. Uh, he uh, uh, is enormously accomplished academically, uh, goes from there to get a real day job, which is what we encourage all of you to do, to at least pay a little bit of rent and eat. Uh, then, um, then he moves over to, um, uh, to working on Wall Street um, to, uh, uh, to be able to sock away uh, some money to uh, afford uh, moving into making a difference in the social arena, which he did very early on after a, being a young vice president at Goldman Sachs. He moves over um, to join the Treasury Department in 2006, which was a pretty heady time to join the Treasury Department, the, um, uh, the peak of the, uh, of the economy at the time, uh, actually peaked right after he arrived. Uh, I think had he expected what would come next, he may not have signed up for that duty, but uh, thank God Neil was, uh, was on that team along with Hank Paulson and Ben Bernanke and um, Geithner and the others who, in my personal view, having been on Wall Street at that point in time, uh, they should all be bronzed for uh, the heroics in saving the financial economy of this country. Um, there is a lot of mixed reviews uh, on, um, uh, and, and discussion in the media around the success of TARP. Uh, Neil was in charge of TARP in the Treasury Department, uh, and it uh, couldn't have been a more, uh, a more significant metaphor for that shield from the deluge uh, that TARP actually became. And uh, you know, few appreciate that TARP turned out in and of itself to be a, a financial win for the American taxpayer as it was structured. Uh, and that's thanks to having some uh, great financial minds on the case, not just uh, uh, political types running the show. So uh, we thank Neil for that service. Uh, then he decides to go back and, uh, with his coffers drained, uh, go back into the commercial arena and uh, joins PIMCO 
at a time when uh, PIMCO, who was the greatest bond house uh, in the country uh, by most definitions, certainly in terms of assets under management, uh, PIMCO didn't have a lot in the equity arena. So Neil came along to run their equities business. And what a tremendous opportunity. I mean, PIMCO is plugged into uh, every institutional uh, and, um, uh, and retail pocket imaginable in the, uh, in the investment world. And to, to start a, um, uh, an equities business off of that would just be plug and play. You'd think it'd be very exciting. And Neil took it on, and uh, they grew dramatically. But then in the middle of it decides it's that time again. And uh, California is a mess as a state, and I'm going to try to make a difference. So uh, Neil, uh, with no background as an elected official, decides to dive into the governor's race. And uh, Neil did an extraordinary job in marshalling a campaign that, in my view, was um, as good as we've seen um, in this state in a long time. Uh, and all I would say is I, I would point you to, on YouTube, find the debate between Neil and Governor Brown. And if the merits were to matter in an election, Neil would be governor of the state of California um, based on that uh, particular uh, debate. But it was very funny. There's just one moment where Jerry Brown says to Neil, uh, or no, and Neil says to Jerry Brown, okay, so this was terrific, uh, Mr. Governor. I'll look forward to the next one. And he said, there will be no next one. <laughs> I don't need a next one, so uh, we're not going to do a next one. This was, in so many words, it was very uncomfortable for Jerry Brown. Uh, but uh, so then Neil uh, moves on to um, his current role, which he'll tell you all about, a very exciting position as uh, president of the Minneapolis Fed, back in the social arena and, um, uh, and making a difference for, uh, for all of us. So uh, enough said. I will turn it over to Neil. and. Uh, Cameron is going to do a little uh, Charlie Rose here, and uh, uh, don't be shy. Thank you. Well, thank you, Harry. Appreciate that warm introduction. Harry and I became friends. Uh, we have a good mutual friend of ours that I worked with. He was at the White House named Al Hubbard. Introduced me to Harry, and we became good friends. I was actually visiting my friend Al. <clears throat> Uh, he has an annual ski trip in Vail, and so I was skiing in Vail, and somebody said, started talking about their friend Harry from Santa Barbara. And I said, I know a friend Harry from Santa Barbara, and it turned out Harry was there. So good to see you, Harry. Thanks for making this happen, and Cameron, thanks for uh, hosting as well. Let me just start and spend a couple minutes and talk about the Federal Reserve, because most people don't know much about it, and it's okay if you don't. But I'd like to level set just to tell you why I'm here and what I do, and then we can turn into the, to the questions. So our nation, the United States of America, as Americans, we've always hated the idea of having a central bank. That's what the Fed is. So Alexander Hamilton created the first central bank. It lasted about 20 years. And then they said, we don't like having this mysterious thing. Let's get rid of it. And the, the reason they didn't like having a central bank is it just seemed mysterious. A bunch of bankers in a closed room doing God knows what. It just sounds very undemocratic. And then in the 1800s, our country kept getting hit with financial crises all the time, and then leading up to the financial panic of 1907. And so Congress said, you know, we can't have this anymore. We need a central bank to manage the big peaks and valleys, the panics of an economy. What are we going to do? We're going we're to need to create one. But they still hated the idea of having all this power concentrated in Washington, D.C., or in New York. So they came up with this compromise. And the compromise was, they created the Board of Governors that you've heard about, and it has the Chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. So that was Alan Greenspan, Ben Bernanke, now Janet Yellen, all based in Washington, D.C. There's up to seven of them, and they're appointed by the President of the United States, confirmed by the United States Senate. But then 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks, the Minneapolis Fed being one of them, the San Francisco Fed being another one, we are scattered around the country. But we're not appointed by the President of the United States. The presidents of these banks are appointed by a local board of directors. And that was the compromise that Congress created in 1913 so we can have a central bank but not have it concentrated all the power in Washington, D.C. or New York. It's a federated structure, hence the Federal Reserve System. And that's why we have these, these 12 banks. Now, when the system was created 100 years ago, the western part of the United States was not very populated. 
So you have the San Francisco, San Francisco Fed covering the whole western part of the US now has 60 million people compared to the Minneapolis Fed, which has a tiny population. But that, it, that, those geographies made sense in 1913. And so that's why we're here. So we get involved in monetary policy. We, uh, we meet eight times a year to set interest rates. My job is to look at the national economy, but also to look at my region. So when we get together, I'm able to speak about what's happening in the local economy in my region. We regulate banks uh, around the country and in our regions. We provide other banking services uh, to, for example, payment services are provided by the Fed. And we do a lot of economic research as well as what's happening in the economy, what are the challenges, what are potential solutions. So we have a staff of world-class economists. Actually, the, the Federal Reserve System is the biggest recruiter of economists in the world. Like it's the biggest buyer of economists, so to speak. So we tap into that talent to try to chat, take on important economic issues as well. So one last thing I'm going to say, then I'm going to turn it over to Cameron. We have what's called a blackout period around our FOMC meetings, our Federal Reserve, uh, Federal Open Market Committee meetings, where we're not allowed to talk about monetary policy right before a meeting. Well, the blackout dates changed, and today we're now in blackout. So I had a choice. I could either cancel this event, or I could come and talk to you, but agree not to talk about monetary policy. So that's what we're going to do, is I'm here to talk to you, but I'm not going to be able to answer any questions about monetary policy just because I'm within the Federal Reserve's blackout dates. And, uh, but there's still a lot of other stuff we can talk about. So thank you, and happy to turn it over to Cameron. Great. Thanks, Neil. Um, so I've actually, in my role as moderator, I'm a little bit more of a, a conduit for questions. As most of you know, over the last week, I've collected a number of questions um, from, from the audience, and I've, I've given them a little bit of uh, curation. And so then I'm, I'm going to pose these to you. They're, they're centered primarily on three different areas. One is, um, the first area is this uh, Minneapolis plan that, that your office has put out uh, to deal with too big to fail. So I think the first set of questions will, will be surrounding this. Um, the second issue is just sort of your, um, given your unique uh, portfolio of experience both in the public and private sector um, surrounding finance and regulation, there's some interest in your view about uh, regulation and the politics of regulation. Sure. Um, and then third, um, some more broad of your reflections on, on your own career. Sure. So, um, as long as that's okay. You know, and Absolutely. If, and if anything's out of bounds, No, no, no. I'm sure uh, uh, look, I try to pride myself on being, I try to err on the side of maximum transparency, open access. I do Twitter Q&As with the public. So, no, nothing's off. The only thing that's off bounds is monetary policy. Okay, so nothing about interest rates. We won't yeah. go there. Um, okay, so so again, so you've just recently put out the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis has just recently put out this plan to end too big to fail. Um, and as as I read it, there were these four components, four big components. One was increasing equity requirements or common equity capital requirements. Um, the second was identifying banks that are systemic risks because they're large and adding an additional capital requirement. Um, a third was taxing leverage in the shadow banking sector, and a fourth was trying to reduce um, the regulatory requirements on small community banks. Right? Um, so maybe starting off, given that you know, a number of folks on Wall Street, Jamie Dimon most prominently, but many others have said, hey, you know, we've already got excessive requirements in, on leverage and capital. Um, wh why is it that you feel we need to go further with these sure. first two? So you know, I went to Treasury as part of the Bush administration. We were a free market Republican administration. We hated the idea of intervening in markets or bailing out any firms, regardless of the sector. It just was, it went against our free market principles. And then we found ourselves in the middle of this terrible financial crisis facing a horrible choice, either doing nothing and allowing the financial system to collapse, and I agree with Harry's characterization of what would have happened, or using taxpayer money to go in and stabilize the financial system. And so at the root, and by the way, I think that that has led to the political divisions that we still experience in the country. I think that a lot of the anger in the country stems right back to the financial crisis and the fact that we had to use taxpayer dollars to bail out firms. And nobody wanted to have to do that. And so the, the key is, have we reduced that risk enough? And should we do more? You know, safety, think about uh, physical safety. Think about the risk of terrorism. We can never eliminate the risk of terrorism. You can never make it zero. And you know that safety isn't free. Right? You pay for it, you're more law enforcement officers, you pay for it when you go to the airport and you stand in line in a metal detector. More safety comes with more costs. So we as a society have to decide how much safety do we want and what price are we willing to pay for that safety. 
So we did analysis at the Minneapolis Fed looking at a range of options and concluded that if we implement our plan, we can increase the safety of the financial system for the American people and the benefits of that exceed the cost to society. And that's, that was the root cause or the root analysis under, underlying our plan. And so maybe the costs of this insurance, of this safety, do you have a sense of the incidents and who they fall on, the cost of this sure. and where the benefits fall? You know, there are some professors, some uh, economics professors, not all, but some, believe that increasing capital requirements has no cost to society. That there's this theorem called Modigliani and Miller and it'll all work out and there's no cost. I don't buy it. I do think you increase capital requirements on banks, it will lead to marginally more expensive loans for their borrowers. So what we say is for the biggest banks in America, we increase their capital requirements. For smaller banks, we reduce regulation. The biggest banks borrowers will face marginally more expensive loans, but they'll have a lot more choices to go from to get those loans. And overall, the economy as a whole will be better off. So again, we're not saying, we're not claiming safety is free. We're claiming there are trade-offs, and Congress ultimately should make that call on behalf of the American people. Yeah, okay, so then what about these small community banks? Um, there's a lot of discussion of Dodd-Frank excessively burdening the small community banks. And, and in, in, your, in your plan, you have, um, you have some ideas about how to reduce that burden. Yeah. How do we, why are we treating some banks differently? How do we decide which are these banks that we can reduce the burden on sure. when you're also worried about uh, the increased risk and, and insuring the country against these risks? Well, the, the reason is because if a small bank fails, there's no risk of it bringing down the whole U.S. economy. And so the fact, you know, I, I use this analogy, and some of my friends who work at big banks get mad at me for using it, but it's the best analogy I have, so uh, forgive me. Uh, but a big bank, in a lot of ways, think about it like a nuclear reactor. If a nuclear reactor melts down, it's devastating for society. So you, governments will spend whatever it takes to stabilize that nuclear reactor, not for the, that power company's own sake, but for everybody else's sake. Well, that's not true of a little community bank that fails. So in the savings and loan crisis in the late 1980s, a thousand little banks failed. But there was no risk of an economic collapse for the whole country. That's why it is important that we, we figure out who is systemically risky, who are those nuclear reactors, and not capture everybody else at the same time. And one of the perverse things about the regulations that have been passed since the crisis is they've, in, in a sense, made the too big to fail problem worse because the advantages that the big banks have is now bigger. So if you're a little community bank and you have to hire one more compliance officer to implement these regulations, that can completely change your profitability. It's easier for big banks to hire one or two more compliance officers than it is for a little tiny community bank to do that. So you're seeing a lot of consolidation among the smallest banks because they say they cannot afford to keep up with this compliance. So that's why I do think it makes sense to rationalize regulations on the smallest banks, but make sure that we've really dealt with the too big to fail issue. And by the way, if we really capitalize the biggest banks to the levels that I think are appropriate, I think we could relax some of the micromanagement that they're living under today because we would know they have that buffer to protect all of us. The one last thing, you know, when, when you go to buy a home after you graduate, let's say you go to buy a home, I bought, Christine and I bought a house a year and a half ago. We got a mortgage. The bank made us put 20% down. Now the reason the bank makes us put 20% down is to protect the bank in case we run into trouble. That's what that 20% is there for. If we made the biggest banks put 20% down on their investments, that 20% would protect taxpayers. That's literally what we're talking about. So another thing that, um that a number of questions have come in on is alternative plans, right? So why don't we just directly break up some of these big banks? Why don't we institute or reinstitute, right? This is the golden era thinking. Back in the golden era, the Glass-Steagall prevented certain risk-taking activities. Why don't we reinstitute Glass-Steagall? Sure. Right? So there are a number of alternatives. What is it about your, your plan that you think does, does better than these alternatives? Well, let's take those one at a time. Let's, let's take Glass-Steagall. So what Glass-Steagall said was, Investment banking had to be separate from commercial banking in its simplest form. But if you look at the crisis, we had pure play institutions failing and creating systemic risk. So Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers were pure play investment banks and they were systemically risky. You also had pure play commercial banks get into trouble. It was not simply the merger of these two activities that led to the risk. It was the scale and the interconnectedness 
that led to the risk. So I'm not opposed to reintroducing Glass-Steagall, but I don't think it would solve the problem, and I don't want us to get a false sense of security that it would. In terms of physically going in and breaking up the banks, I think it's very hard for government regulators to know, you know, how do you divide up a big bank into ways that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so what our, our plan is simply saying, here are the high capital requirements, and if you're a large bank CEO, you can decide. Either you live with these new capital requirements, or you might choose to restructure yourself. And we think the markets are better equipped to decide how a bank should restructure itself than the government is. So you may have a business line that really truly has great economies of scale. And you might say, you know what, we're going to keep this business line, this payment business, at full scale, and we're going to highly capitalize it because it deserves to be that big and it can afford it. And these other business lines, you know what, it makes sense to shrink them or to spin them off in pieces. But we, again, we think that the boards of directors and the management teams of those banks are best positioned. We'll just set the standards and they can choose how they want to meet the standards. And do you think that the government is capable of figuring out that differential and what the added uh, capital requirements for systemically large banks are? How, how do you go about doing that, for instance? Well, that's what we, that was the core of our plan. So all the details of how we ran the analysis are there. You know, the IMF did something fascinating. The IMF looked at the history of financial crises all around the world, and they came up with a database and said, when, how frequently have crises happened, and what were the capitalization levels of the banks in those systems that had crises. This is a lot like trying to predict terrorist events, right? These are not high frequency events. So you have to look at the handful of, of events that have happened and see what you can learn from them. Well, we can actually estimate the probability of a financial crisis based on the capitalization of the banks in the banking sector, based on this database. So if you looked in 2006, if we had the database then, 2006, we had about an 85% chance of another crisis sometime in the next century. Now, of course, it happened a couple years later. That 85 or 86% chance has now been reduced to about a 75% chance. So we've come down the curve because we've raised capital requirements. But there's still about a 75% chance of a crisis in the next century. To me, that's too high. Mm -hmm. And so the problem is societies are prone to repeating the same mistakes. It's not the same people. It's not going to be you and me. It's going to be your kids or your grandkids who forget the lessons learned and repeat the same mistakes. So I'm not worried about who's running these banks today. The problem is 30 or 40 years from now, none of us know who's going to be running these banks. And we're all going to tell ourselves, oh, it's different now. And that's when we get into danger. Well, maybe then we'll, we'll that's a nice little period on that, sure. uh, on that segment. Maybe we can transition away from the, uh, the Minneapolis plan and towards sort of a broader theory of uh, political economy of regulation since you've gone back and forth how you see these kinds of issues. Um, as you know, the seven members of the Board of Governors of the Fed system serve staggered 14-year terms so that uh, one member is replaced every two years. But because of Senate refusal to consider recent nominations, um, there are actually three vacancies at the moment that can be filled, um, which means that there could be a significant shift uh, in uh, when the appointments are made. And at the same time, there are a number of members of Congress that are openly hostile to the Fed, um, antagonistic, very publicly antagonistic in various ways, threatening closer oversight. Um, so in your opinion, how real is the danger um, that the Fed will become politicized, uh, responsive to the short-term goals of elected officials? And, and maybe as a follow-up, how responsive and accountable should the Fed's positions be to partisan majorities? Well, Fed, so what you're really getting at is Fed independence. One of the miracles of central banking of the past 30 or 40 years was what then Chairman Volcker did in raising rates in the early 80s to crush inflation. And the thing about this is he knowingly inflicted great harm on the economy, right? We had 10% unemployment at the peak of our Great Recession. He had 10% unemployment in the recessions that he triggered. So it was enormously costly. But in doing so, he crushed inflation and he taught the American people that an independent central bank will lead to long-term better outcomes than a politicized central bank. And now we enjoy very low inflation. We enjoy low inflation expectations and, and anchored inflation expectations, largely because both parties, Republicans and Democrats, have said we need to keep the central bank independent of short-term political considerations. So it's always a risk. So think about this. We have three branches of government, the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judiciary. 
they were created by the U.S. Constitution. So they have the Constitution defending them. The Federal Reserve was created by an act of Congress. And that means an act of Congress could decide we don't need a central bank anymore. Just like in the 1800s, they got rid of the Bank of the United States. Uh, so that, that is a risk that's always out there. And so everything we can do to be transparent to the American people, to let Congress know what we're doing and why, to explain our decisions, that's in our interest of protecting the institution of the Fed so that in a non-political manner we can do our jobs, which is focus on interest rates and focus on stable prices and, and maximum employment. And, and do you think that now is a particularly fraught moment for the Federal Reserve, or do you think that now is a, a moment like any other? Well, I think every moment has been fraught since the crisis, because going up into the crisis, the Fed had this communications posture of the Wizard of Oz. Maybe most of you are too young to have seen the Wizard of Oz, but you know, it's like this mystery. Don't look behind the curtain. Don't ask any questions. It's very mysterious. You don't want to know. Well, we had not earned people's trust when we needed it during the crisis. And so in the crisis, we did all these really unpopular things. And people said, well, you haven't earned our trust. Why should we trust you now? So we're now in this trust deficit. And that's part of why I'm airing every chance I get to communicate more, to be more transparent, to engage with the public, to let them know there's no mystery to what we're doing. We're acting on your behalf to try to achieve the goals that Congress has given us. But so I think the last eight years have been perilous, continue to be perilous. And until we see a stronger economy that people really feel good about, I would expect to see the Fed at some risk. OK. Um, so going back to, well, maybe, maybe we'll move on to, to some of your own personal, to your career sure. and some of your reflections about, about the various positions that you've held. Um, between Goldman Sachs, the Treasury, PIMCO, your current position at the Minneapolis Fed, um, you've gone back and forth between the public and private sectors. Um, in the public discourse, there's often, it's often seen as a very different culture in the public and the private sectors. Is this at all your experience? Do you, do you feel like there are systematic differences? Yeah, there are differences. Um, one of the things that I love about being at the Fed and I loved about being at Treasury, there is something really fulfilling for me about working with people who are motivated by societal good. I mean, it's what gets us up in the morning and how do we figure out what's the right thing to do for the country? And let's do our very best. And we have really smart people debating ideas. But at the end of the day, the goal is the same. Let's do the right thing for the country and let the best idea win. And let's go find a way to, to make it happen. And for me, that's very satisfying to be part of that. You know, um, when I ran the TARP, this was a, we had people from all over the country volunteering who wanted to participate, who wanted to help. And I remember we had to build this team. In six months, I hired 140 people in the middle of the crisis. And when people would come to my office finally for their final interview, I would say to them, I already knew they were qualified for the job. And I said, let me just explain to you what your job's going to be. I need you here for no less than the next three or four months. You're going to work six days a week, probably 12 to 15 hours a day. You're going to get paid very little money compared to what you've been getting paid. You're going to get a lot of criticism. You're not going to see your family, and you're going to sit in a cube. Mm -hmm. Are you sure you want to do this? I can't tell you the number of hands that went down when I gave them that speech. But the hands that stayed up were there for the right reasons. And it was never, are you a Republican or Democrat? It was, what are your skills? Why are you here? How can you contribute? And when you put together a team of people who are united by this mission, this common goal, boy, there's almost nothing you cannot accomplish with that group of people. And that's fantastic to be part of that. And so I always miss that when I'm in the private sector. And it's not. I'm not criticizing the private sector, right? People have, you each need to figure out for yourself what gets you up in the morning. For me, getting me up in the morning is not, oh my gosh, my bonus is going to be bigger than it was last year. That was not what gets me up in the morning. What gets me up in the morning is working with people who have this common goal and this public service spirit, and I love that. That's good. I want to pitch you one last question before. Sure. I, I think there's been plenty of material, um, so I think there'll be lots of follow-ups from the audience, but I want to pitch you one last one, which is, um, you've, you've run for governor of California, so you have significant experience with the electoral process and, and that form of accountability. Um, you've worked at Treasury during a period of intense scrutiny, much of which was directed at you, actually. Um, and you have experience, therefore, with sort of media and uh, accountability between elections. So I'm, I'm interested, given these experiences, do you think that our representative democracy 
is capable of ensuring and delivering competence in office? Uh, I think our democracy is very good at responding to the people. So why is it so hard to get legislation passed? Because the American people are divided on a lot of issues. And our elected representatives are reflecting that division. So in many ways, they're doing their jobs reflecting that. Uh, I think the hardest thing for our democracy is preventing bad outcomes. We're very good at when something bad happens, mobilizing. You know, when the crisis hit, we went from asking for the TARP authority, which was deeply controversial, to getting it passed in two weeks. That is lightning speed for any democracy. So this country moves when we're in a crisis. It's much harder to get this country to move when we're not in a crisis. Mm -hmm. Think about the debates about climate change and getting people to agree on, is this a real issue? Even if you agree it is a real issue, who should pay to address it? It's very hard to get people to agree in advance. And so I think that that's the thing that we have to work on the most, is mobilizing people you know, in advance of, of problems. Okay. Great, I think, I, I think at this point, I know that I didn't get through all the questions that were fed to me. So I think at this point we should probably open it up and, and maybe see if there's anybody, if you heard anything that you want to follow up on. Hi, I'm Ryan Chakmack. I'm an economics and mathematics major. So I'd like to ask, this isn't really a follow up so much as another question. But how do you think differences in policy between regional feds and the Board of Governors may contribute to uncertainty in the economy? Well, I think um, there's a communication aspect that I'm going to take that, and then you can tell me if I answered your question or not. So I tr I'm trying to err on the side of over-communicating and being extra transparent. And by the way, my colleagues are too. Everybody, this isn't just me. Everybody at the Fed wants to be more transparent and engage with the public, and I salute them for doing that. However, when you have 17 people making predictions about interest rate decisions, it leads to great confusion in the markets, and I think it leads to noise. So even if we were not in blackout, I would not be here telling you, this is what I think is going to happen at the next meeting. This is how many rate hikes I think we're going to have. Because number one, we've been wrong a lot the last several years, and people really don't like it when we're wrong. And number two, it just adds to noise. If I'm making predictions of this many rate hikes and somebody else is making predictions of that many rate hikes, I do think it adds to confusion. So what I've tried to do is say, I'm going to answer all your questions. You know, after, uh, I'm a voter this year, so after my first vote in January, I published a very long essay explaining all of the data I looked at in how I reached my conclusion to hold interest rates steady. I did the same thing in March when I dissented. That's my way of being transparent to you. Here's the data I'm looking at, but I'm looking at it backwards. The, the, the decision I just made, this is how I made that decision, so you can get a sense of what we call my reaction function, as opposed to predictions going forward, which I think leads to confusion. So I think if we as a Fed did more retrospectives and less forecasting, I think it would lead to less confusion, but still meet our transparency needs. So that's what I'm trying to do, but I can't tell you I've got it all right. I'm, I'm experimenting, so to speak, but the feedback so far has been pretty positive. Thanks for your question. <laughs> I'll, I'll repeat it. There you go. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. My name is Brian Landeros. I'm a philosophy, politics, and economics major here. And at the beginning of your discussion, you sort of talked about um, easing the regulatory the regulatory burden that a lot of uh, banks uh, today have to deal with, and I'm really curious as to what your view on the what your views are on the DFAS and CCAR stress tests, and if those capital requirements have been effective in sort of um, uh, and sort of like easing easing the likelihood of a sort of financial crisis in the future. So, uh, the, what was your name again? Brian. Brian. So Brian asked about the stress test. So the Fed, after the financial crisis, now runs takes all these detailed data from the banks and runs them through financial scenarios to see what happens to their capital if these different bad shocks hit the, hit the banks and hit the economy. So I think that's a useful exercise to stress test these banks to see how sound their balance sheets are. But we have to be humble about this because 
you know, the nature of financial crises is nobody sees it coming. Because if we saw it coming, regulators or the bankers or the rating agencies would do something about it. And so when I describe the crisis that we just experienced, if I were to boil it down to the root cause, we all participated, myself included, in a nationwide delusion that home prices only go up. And if home prices only go up, all of these mortgage-backed securities and these CDOs, they all make perfect sense because you can diversify your risk away. But the moment home prices go down, the models all blow up. Well, that's, this was a belief that regulators shared, the rating agencies, the bankers, home buyers, we all shared it. And the hard part is, so stress testing is valuable, but I'm also humble enough to know we're going to miss it some point. And so we need to make sure the banks have enough capital so that when the regulators screw up and the stress test didn't predict the actual economic shock, the banks are still strong. So useful, but in my opinion, insufficient. Thanks. Hi. Hi, thank you for coming. My name is Wes. Um, uh, I just wanted to ask you, you mentioned in your talk the discrepancies in population based on the regional boundaries when they were first set up for the Fed, and then also running for governor of California. I wanted to ask about um, differences between local and national control for uh, monetary policy and um, like fiscal policy. Is it something where local and regional authorities can exercise any kind of meaningful control or checks based on, or to reflect the differences in their economies? Or is it something that because of our interconnected system, it basically all goes to the national level? Well, certainly monetary policy all goes to the national level. And the reason that works here is because we have the free flow of labor and goods, right? There are no tariffs between the states. You can move to any state you want and get a job. And so we are truly a national economy, a national market, even though there are regional differences, obviously, within them. And when we set interest rates, we're trying, we have to set interest rates for the country as a whole, but we do pay attention to what is happening in local economies. So I do speak about at the FOMC meetings, I will speak about what's happening in my district, even though I'm also making a recommendation for the national economy as a whole. So monetary policy definitely needs to be done nationally. Um, we have one currency, obviously, that we all share. Uh, fiscal policy is a combination. So you obviously have federal uh, fiscal policy. You also have state budgets. You have local budgets, local tax authorities. And I think that that makes sense, that fiscal policy is a combination of local, state, and national, while monetary policy is national. Way in the back. Is this on? Yes. Hi. Thanks for coming this afternoon. Um, post-2008, the Federal Reserve was given massive regulatory authority over financial institutions. Um, and I'm curious as um, I think the Fed was given it largely because they do a lot of things really well, and we wanted people who do things well to do it. But why you think that sort of regulatory authority should reside in the Federal Reserve instead of a more politically responsive uh, agency? Well, I think you answered the question, right? I think it, it should be less politically responsive and more focused just on the analysis and the, and the long-term issues. So um, in the late 70s, Congress gave the Fed what we call our dual mandate, which means stable prices, so low inflation, we define it as 2% inflation, and maximum employment. But if you go back in time to the original founding of the Fed that I started talking about, it really was about financial stability. So even though our dual mandate is stable prices and maximum employment, the Fed also has an implicit responsibility to look out for financial stability. That's why we were founded. And so I think it's from the financial stability angle that the Fed's authorities, especially over the largest institutions, become so important. Because it, whether we like it or not, the Fed owns financial stability. And if the Fed is not going to own the financial stability mandate, I'm not sure who is. I mean, obviously, there's the Financial Stability Oversight Committee, the FSOC, that Dodd-Frank created. And the Fed is part of that. But in its mandate, I think the Fed has to think about financial stability considerations uh, as we deliberate you know, all of these set of issues. In the front here. Hi, thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about, in the last few years, I think we've seen a lot of conversations about the role of Wall Street in government, um, and particularly if we think about like 08, we had yourself and Hank Paulson, um, today Mnuchin, Gary Cohn, people like that, um, and especially actually all four of you are Goldman people in particular. So if you could talk a little bit about how you respond to sort of the government Sachs criticism and um, just the general role of Wall Street in government regulation and appointments and things like that. Sure, Look, I understand people's sensitivity to it. The, the concerns are, very reasonable to be concerned about the optics and the appearance. I do think, as Harry mentioned at the start, I do think it is very useful to have people that have 
some technical experience in these issues in government. But again, they need to be there for the right reasons. And so, <clears throat> you know, I've had people call me up from some banks, some of my friends say, what the hell are you doing working on this too big to fail issue? You're supposed to be one of us. And I said, you know, my job is to look at risks and identify risks and come up with solutions to those risks. And so I think that the vast majority of people who volunteer for government service are doing it out of a sense of public service. And I think if that's the guide, then I think we're going to be just fine. And a mix of experiences is useful. It's great, you know, at the Fed, I work with a lot of economists and a lot of people who are Fed lifers. And they're terrific. These are great people who are really smart and talented. And they bring a different set of experiences and skills than I have. And we end up working really well together. So I think a combination of skills is best overall, not all of one or all of the other. Well, unfortunately, we run out of time. So, and I think that was actually an excellent question and response to end with. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you.